wonderful to be here at this um, fabulous festival. Been wanting to make it since um, well for a few years, and here we finally are. Um, really is tremendous to be speaking to you today about a topic that not so many years ago, probably I'd only be talking um, to about with my um, sort of academic colleagues. Um, these days, everyone's talking about biolinks. They mightn't be calling them biolinks. They might call them wildlife corridors. And they're talking about them because they're a really big part of solving the species extinction crisis. Just one part of it, but a really important part. And the only way we can build them is if we all understand what our role is, or understand what they are and what we can do to help build them, because they will take an effort from everybody. And I'm going to tell you why this is through this talk. I'm going to sort of explain really what a biolink is, what constitutes a biolink that will work, and then how and what scale we need to build them to make a difference and then and how we can actually do this. So we're going to cover a bit of ground. Um, uh, uh, let's get going. I want to start um, by talking about, um, you know how we have, we have scientists have come up with um, greenhouse gas emission targets. We know how much greenhouse gas we can, we can have in, safely have in the atmosphere before we tip into dang dangerous climate change. And we've set emission targets, or countries have, and they're trying to meet these targets to keep us in safe limits. Just recently, scientists have also come up with ecosystem restoration targets. The amount of ecosystems is a system that we have to restore to avert the species extinction crisis. And what these scientists, international scientists, have come together and determined is that we've got to act fast and we have to scale up our restoration effort. We have to preserve or protect 30% of natural ecosystems by 2030. So, we're, and, and, and we have, we, the IUCN is the body, they like the IPCC, who are an international body of scientists that have come up and determined that this is the challenge for us. And we, the United Nations have declared the decade that we're in, the decade of ecosystem restoration. We're two years into the decade, so we've got about eight years to protect um, the Earth. So that's a global target. What's the situation in central Victoria? Well, Victor, central Victoria is experiencing the same species extinction crisis. But how, how special is it? How much does it matter? Well, it matters a lot because we're actually living in a very biodiverse part of the world. There are 2,000 native species. Now, these are not, there's more than 2,000 species. This is just counting the birds, animals, frogs, plant species. It's not counting the, the lower order fungi and insects. 2,000 species in this region, more than Europe combined. And a lot of those species aren't found anywhere else in the world. So we've got an important region. You'll recognise some of these gorgeous critters. Um, Six species of Grevillea alone in, in, in central Victoria, and, and many of them are not found anywhere else. So we live in a very special place, but it is in trouble. 26 native animal species have already disappeared from the landscape, and we've got 198 animal species that are threatened with extinction, and 575 plant species threatened. And we know why these species are in trouble. Um, We've cleared a lot of the state. We've only got about 34% uh, of native vegetation cover left or habitat left. And it's been left in small isolated um, fragments by and large. And this is a real problem. One of the key threats to biodiversity is a loss of habitat and that fragmentation of the habitat. 14% has been protected in the National Park Estate and 3% on private land. What's the target we need to meet? Much higher than that. Um, and, and then, so habitat fragmentation and loss is a big issue, but in, in central Victoria we've had 50 years of very intensive gold mining and it's still going on, as Wendy was pointing out. And, and, and we can't underestimate the damage that that period did to our environment. It was wholesale environmental change and it was really widespread, much more widespread than we know today. And the impact of that is lasting, it's with us. And we've got We've got ongoing threats. I know, isn't that shocking? It's a Leadbetter's possum, it's not a Fasca gale, but you know. Um, so we've, you know, feral, feral animals, um, um, introduced plant species, weed species, 
uh, constant and, and persistent threats. A recent study um, looked at these two culprits, particularly bad ones, cats and foxes, um, estimating the number of species they kill a year in Australia, 2.6 billion. More than all the species that disappear in those mega fires every year ongoing. Now, another thing that we need to think about, our reserves are so important, as Wendy's been pointing out, absolutely important, and we need more of them, and we need, we need to look after the ones we've got, but we actually need to expand them. We need to, because a lot of our threatened species actually aren't protected in those reserves at the moment. They're living on our farmlands. They're in the areas that are unprotected. 50% of Australians' threatened species occur primarily, almost 50%, 48, on, on private land or occur between land tenures, bit of public, bit of private. So we need to urgently scale up ecological protection and restoration. Um, we, need to, um, we need to restore the full range of ecosystems so that we get these species that are on private lands that aren't found anywhere else. Um, and we also need to make sure that we um, preserve or, or, or recon we um, restore functioning ecosystems, ecosystems that are resilient and able to respond to climate change. Um, so ecosystems that are healthy, resilient and able to adapt to future pressures. And this is where biolinks come in. Biolinks are one of the key things that we can do to ensure our ecosystems are resilient and can, pers can persist into the future. So, Biolinks are a key aspect of restoring ecosystem function. What biolinks do, they connect our, um, ex uh, our fragmented um, important habitat and they ena enable species to move safely through it, to escape wildfire, to escape other threats, to find food when there's drought in one location. So species need to move. Um, and at the moment they're kind of trapped in these isolated patches and movements are restricted with a, such a fragmented landscape. Uh, they need to move to breed, to find mates, to colonise new areas. Um, under changing climate, genetic diversity, maintaining the genetic diversity of our, of our um, native species is going to be really important because that is what's going to allow species to adapt to a changing world. And a lot of our species, when they're trapped in their little pockets, they're becoming inbred. They need, we need more cross, cross genetic, genetic crossing. And biolinks are one of the most important strategies that will enable species to adapt, to adapt to climate change. And I've got a couple of graphs to show you what I mean here. This is a, we, we know that the climate's changing, it's already changed a lot, but we also know it's going to change more. And what is the impact on ecosystems? Well, species will respond to this. This is some modelling that was done by CSRO that shows just how different ecosystems will be in the year 2050 under a sort of conservative um, carbon emission scenario. And what it's showing is that in, in around central Victoria, they'll be very different. Um, the dark red means more different, um, the darker orange means more different to the present day. Um, a lot of our ecosystems will be, have 80% of the species that they'll contain in 2050 will be not species that you recognise in those ecosystems today. So species will need to move and, and respond to climate change, the change that's coming. And in fact, they already are. So when we look at woodland bird distributions in Australia, and we compare the, the centre of their distributions in 1950 to what those distributions are now, in, um, we can see that they've changed. They're already moving in response to climate changing climates. They're moving upslope to cooler and moister areas and they're moving down latitude, more southerly migrations. So we've already locked in a fair bit, had a fair bit of climate change since 1950 in fact, and we are already seeing that species are responding by moving over large scales. This study is really interesting from a biolinks design perspective because what it shows us is the scale that we're going to have to reconnect the landscape to enable species to respond to climate change. And it's over distances of 200 to 400 kilometres, over the really large scale. So there we go, a statement I've just made. We're going to have to connect the landscape over large scales. And we're going to have to work out how to form functional ecological connections through all our land types, through our farmlands, um, through our urban areas. 
So we're all going to have to work out how we can play a part. So it's going to take everyone. But it's also going to take scientific and sophisticated design. Plopping a tree here and a tree there really isn't going to kind of, kind of cut it. I'm going to go on and talk about, give you an example of how we might think about how to design these ecosystems so that they can support our farmland and all the other land uses that we need to, we need to you know, put land to and better support nature. So I want to talk about a study that was done on woodland birds in the ACT region by CSIRO scientist Veronica Durr about a decade ago. What she did was put radio transmitters on um, a suite of little specialist woodland birds, woodland birds that need quite good intact woodland habitat to persist. This is a brown tree creeper, you probably all recognise him, well it's actually her. So she was a young dispersing um, female. She was living with her parents most of the time in the larger patches of bush. But she would make these little forays out into the wider landscape. But she did it in very particular ways. She moved through the landscape using the scattered paddock trees. So she would go out every morning and make these little journeys. She might have been searching a mate. She might have been sick of her parents and wanted to find a, you know, a new place to set up on her own. Um, and she would take this journey out um, very carefully along these, these, these remaining tall trees. But she would only, the trees need to be spaced less than 100 metres apart for her to visit them. After she'd gone about one and a half kilometres, she'd turn around and go back for lunch. Now, Veronica didn't just put a tracker on this little one. She did many of these, um, these brown tree creepers and she did a suite of other woodland bird species. She was looking for generalities. Are there ways that these species routinely move through the landscape? Um, she enlisted the, um, the Canberra Orphan Ornithological Society to come and stake out and sit around 93 trees in this landscape to have a look at the problem, the issue from another perspective. They sat out there and they recorded what was visiting these trees because what she wanted to do, then ask was were there any sort of configurations that particularly worked for, for these woodland birds that they were pre preferring over others. And she found that these woodland birds, and a suite of them, not just the brown tree keepers, were using those trees, but only rarely, and only to move to other patches of landscape that were around about, or no more than 1.3 kilometres away. She then looked in the wider literature and thought, are other people finding this with other suites of birds? in other places and she found that actually yes there were some very general kind of patterns to be found here and in fact some of these patterns were also holding for some of our smaller marsupials. Um, I won't talk about the generals that's another story um, and she came up with a model some rules she calls it the um, the 100 meter 1.1 kilometer 10 hectare rule so if we want to functionally reconnect the landscape we need to conserve patches of bush that are ideally bigger than 10 hectares. 10 hectares is a magic number for species richness. If you've got 10 hectares, you'll get a lot more species than an area that's smaller. Um, but those areas need to be no more than 1.1 kilometre away from another decent sized patch of bush. And we don't need to connect those two um, patches of bush with a continuous corridor of trees, as people actually have often thought about a biolink as being scattered trees will absolutely um, will do the job and in fact they'll do the job better than a continuous corridor. So this is really an interesting finding if we're thinking about how we're going to design biolinks through our landscapes and still accommodate some of the other land uses that we want to put into. Now of course we can't generalise, this is a wonderful, wonderful rule to have and it's very, very useful for designing a lot of our biolinks in this area for our woodland birds. But it won't hold true for everything. We, different species will have different movement qualities. It characterises thinking about squirrel gliders. They, um, they, can, they move through gliding from treetop to treetop. Their maximum glide is probably around about 40 metres. So they need more closely spaced trees than our woodland birds. And you can see that people are doing all sorts of things to augment connectivity between fragmented populations when those trees aren't present. We, we can use glider poles. 
Um, these are old stoby poles that have been erected on a freeway and are working very well to connect these two patches of bush. And we also need to think about our aquatic species. They'll have different connect. They also need to move. They need suites of connected wetlands, water bodies. One dries up. They need to be able to move on to another. How do they move through the landscape? What will they move through? Do they need remnant vegetation? Will a wildlife corridor suffice? So there are studies going on to that. Um, we haven't got time to cover them all today, but um, they, it is looking like they also need patches of remnant vegetation that's relatively well connected to enable um, movement between wetland bodies. So, we used to design wildlife corridors. Piece of forest here, piece of forest here, let's connect it with a continuous row of trees. We need to get much more sophisticated. Wildlife corridors aren't going to suit everyone. Species will move through them, they're not, they're, they're useful, but we really need to think a little more ecologically, a little get into the, get into the minds and behaviour of these species and, and look and, and design more sophisticatedly. But what, what we really do know is that we need to design biolinks that are actually mosaics of different habitat that are connected in ways that species will move through the landscape. So you can see here we've got forest, we've got woodland, we've got open woodland, we've got grassland. What we need in front of is another patch of woodland and to be connected by that open woodland. And then you've got a, a nice big connected area of habitat. That's what a biolink can, should be looking like. Um, I will say that connection alone is not enough. Bilinks are incredibly important, but we've really also, in this region particularly, got to think about the health of the habitat that we are connecting with our bilinks. And in many cases, it will need some help and restoration. That's just a little flag to say that bilinks aren't everything and that those habitat patches are jewels and we need to not take our attention off their health and connectivity too. So, the big question, can this be done? Well, it can. Um, but it will change, uh, take change from us all. I think we'll need to change our attitude to nature. We'll have to be thinking about how we can accommodate nature better in our lives. Um, we'll really need to raise people's ecological literacy. We'll need to help people to see what is valuable in their landscape and how they can support it. This is a real biggie. We're going to, we, we won't be able to um, have one blueprint that will work everywhere around biolink design. We will need to develop tailored plans for particular landscapes around the ecosystems and the species they support. And we will need to work together in ways that we haven't before. Um, making sure that local actions at properties are adding up to something more. And it will also require, there's no doubt about it, um, sig significantly more funding than, than ecological restoration is currently receiving. So just a little bit about Biolinks Alliance and our role in all this. We are there to support the community to access the latest, latest science and to collaborate to get the impacts we need at the really large landscape scales that, 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 um, that we, 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 need to, we need to do this at. So um, we're doing this through um, annual knowledge symposia, which brings, um, we bring together leading scientists to, um, to talk about um, you know, key issues and address key issues and provide the, the knowledge and science that we need to design sophisticated biolinks and restore landscapes. Um, and they're really, really important events that we've been having for six, six years now and building the most fabulous specialist central Victorian knowledge hub um, for the conservation community here. So um, accessing all that information, specialist information that we're pulling together online and, and making putting it there in perpetuity for everybody else to access. Um, we're also uh, organising field days and workshops for field-based learning um, with community groups in particular areas. Uh, they're really effective and really important. Um, we're all, we are supporting coordinated action. We're, we're helping communities to, to collaborate. Um, we've been uh, bringing together local communities who want to design biolinks to help identify what are the valuable assets in their area, for the natural assets in their area, and how best to support them and how best to make sure that they are connected. Um, and we're doing this through what we're calling a local to landscape planning process. And it really does involve a lot of shared learning, and then to come up with a practical plan for landscape scale ecological restoration in these communities. 
Um, here's an example, one that we've done down near the Kyneton region, the Green Hill to Black Hill Biolink. You can see that we've identified in an area that really looks extremely clear. Um, most locals were quite um, amazed that there really was so much na nature. And it was really through going out and surveying these properties and 18 interested landholders in this region that we found all sorts of gems there. Important springs and soaks, large old trees. We know their value as important connectors as well as habitat. Now this community were motivated to bring koalas back to this landscape. Um, someone who grew up in this region remembers koalas routinely passing through, commonly passing through, and haven't been there for 20 or 30 years. So um, we have set up, uh, you know, I guess projects that are going to support the recreation of habitat and linkages to once again allow koalas to, to inhabit this region. But we found other important values there too, that we're again designing specific, pro or raising the community's awareness of how to protect and, and how to enhance and designing specific projects to help them do that. So we need lots of these landscape plans owned and led by community across central Victoria to make in, an impact. And we've got another really great project where we're doing a similar local to landscape process in the Heathcote region. So come and see our stall if you'd like to hear more about that one. So lots of local scale projects, but then they all need to be connected up at that 200, 400 kilometre scale that climate change is, is, is demanding we act at. And so that's another role of the Alliance, is to connect those regional projects into the, into the region, even larger scale. So these blobs sort of show our, our membership. Um, as we're an alliance of conservation management networks and land care networks from the Grampians over to Benalla and from the Macedon Ranges going up to the river. And the story actually doesn't stop at state borders. We actually, some of these species, um, need sort of to be connected at even larger scales and so we are a regional partner of an even bigger scale conservation initiative the great eastern ranges which is um, partnering to re reconnect um, wildlife corridors all through the great eastern ranges so look it's a big challenge and we don't have a lot of time to do it but we um, i think one of the things that gives me heart is um, how many people i think um, just are profoundly interested in wanting to help and take actions, but they don't quite know what the best action is to take. And um, I think my message is that, you know, through through coming together, working working together through the alliance and the knowledge provision that we can provide um, with each other, with your neighbours, we can do this. But um, it will take, um, yeah, a lot more collaboration and uh, with scientists, with government, and with community than we've sort of done in the past. So yeah, thanks for listening.